Hello again. It's another Rahala Stepper on tour. We're at the Brighton Theatre Royal and uh, my guest is Simon Evans. If you were looking for Christmas gifts, you could do no better than look for these Rahala Stepper trump card game. It's a wonderful game. Look at this with all my favourite guests, or some of them, uh, and a playable game of trumps. There's a Shrek in there. I'm in there. Look out for them. Go to gofasterstrike.com to buy those, plus my books. So you can get the emergency questions books there and you can get all my DVDs and downloads. Lots and lots of fun things to get. Uh, if you would like to come and see one of these lives or buy tickets for Christmas for someone, go to richhang.com slash gigs. It's the perfect Christmas gift. Everything that I'm in is the perfect Christmas gift because I am very Christmassy. I'm associated with Christmas. Uh, and uh, also become a badger at gofasterstrike.com slash badges and get loads of extras, backstage videos, uh, ad-free audio podcasts if that's your deal. All sorts of stuff on there. All right, let's sit back, relax, and enjoy Rahala Sturpa. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Brighton Theatre Royal. You're already much better than last week's audience. <laughs> Please welcome a man uh, who is worried that he might have let down a squirrel. It's Richard Herring! <laughs> drunker than last week's audience as well, it's weird. <laughs> Strange thing. Uh, so welcome to uh, Richard Herring's Lofty Singing Tenderly podcast. Uh, it's a new move and uh, I've got to come up with a new uh, ideas for podcasts, there's so many of them. So what I'm going to, it's the character Lofty uh, is going to sing, <laughs> each week's going to sing the Whispering Grass song, just as tenderly as possible, be judged by a panel of celebrities and the twist is it's, uh, it's Lofty from EastEnders. It's not, it's, it's Lofty from EastEnders, because the other one's dead. But he's in character as Lofty, it's not the actor. And he might put on a pith helmet. It's, I like, again, that's a reference that um, most, I, I did it to you two, because you know, I think you're the only, <laughs> only ones who'll get what I'm talking. I think, like, sadly, Tom, you don't even know who Lofty from EastEnders is. That's how terrible that reference is. How 20th century can you be, Richard Aaron? Grow up. Uh, but I was talking. I was hanging out at uh, Rowley's Fudge Pantry, uh, which I was disappointed to discover actually sells fudge. And um, <laughs> when in Brighton, that's what I say. <laughs> and Rowley said he calls it Rahalastapa, and, um, <laughs> and then he let me into the, his actual fudge pantry. It was great. So it's thanks, Rowley. <laughs> um, yeah, I've uh, I had a, got a weird incident with a, a squirrel this week. Um, I live in the countryside now. So I'm, I'm driving my daughter to school in the next village. It's a strange thing. We live there's a school in our village, but we didn't get in. <laughs> she wasn't bright enough. It's just terrible. So we have to go to no. There was too many kids in our school, so we had to go to the next village. And I was driving along, and as I was driving along, talking to my daughter, there was a squirrel in the road, like going around in a hectic circle. It had clearly been hit by a car. It was in agony, right? And I was, I was kind of caught between A, being quite squeamish, and thinking, oh, do I have to kill that? And B, thinking, if I run that squirrel over to put out of his misery, what is my daughter going to think? I'm do just, I'm running over a squirrel. I remember the Tufty Club, which, again, I'm going you know, these references uh, <laughs> could I... He's meant to be good at crossing the road, but it's... Uh, <laughs> And so I was dithering, because I really, I, every time I'm called upon to, you know, do anything like this, I'm terrible. And even with a car, I think, well, I shouldn't swerve, anyway, it's dangerous, but also, I just the idea of killing a living creature I was worried about. And then my daughter was in the back, and we, she saw it, we were talking about it, and she, was, she I wondered already, as it was approaching, whether I, it was me already, whether I'd hit it. I said, no, no, I've got, I, I haven't hit, someone else hit it. And she said, was it a baddie that, that did it? Uh, and I had to say, no, it wasn't. It probably was an accident. I don't think there's someone driving around Hertfordshire just trying to take out as many squirrels as possible and being slightly inefficient, just winging them. Um, but it was, it was in so much distress. And so I actually didn't run it over. I let it go. And then I, I felt like I'd... It wasn't even nine o'clock and I felt I'd let a squirrel down. I thought, I'll get it on the way back. But it was 20 minutes later. It, it, it had succumbed to its injuries. And so I didn't, you know, I just felt bad about whether I, that's quite a difficult choice, isn't it? It's a 
to whether you murder a squirrel or let it or let nature take its course. So I felt bad. <laughs> I should have done something uh, a bit more up, upbeat to start the podcast. <laughs> what would you, would you have Would you run over the squirrel, Brighton? Say yes if you would. Yes. Yes. Monsters. <laughs> it might have been somebody when I'd run over it going, I was all right. I just hurt my foot. <laughs> sort of, of sounded a bit like James Acaster, that squirrel, I thought. It was all right. <laughs> anyway. That's what's happened to me this week. Um, my guest this week, he's probably best known for his portrayal of Richard Richard in The Way It Is. Yeah? Instant recognition there from the audience. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome Simon Evans! Richard Richard! <laughs> yes, Richard, there he is. Hello, sir. Come in there. Sit down. Oh. Plenty of merch. Good there are lots of merch. You've got to have a lot. You've got to have a lot of merch, Simon. That's the that's the rule of the game. That's okay. a very classy display. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Puts me in mind of Publishers Clearance Warehouse <laughs> very on an off does. day, but uh, very you know, does. things will pick up in the afternoon. <laughs> so tell us about Richard. Richard, what was? Do you remember playing? Patel yes, Richard Richard. 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 I was I was informed about the format of the show that you would introduce me with a, with an obscure credit yeah. that I'd hopefully forgotten. Funnily enough, I was reading up about the way it is this morning, Are genuinely we? in bed, yeah, because I was trying to remember, we used to have a publicity still which had everyone had gaffer tape over their mouths to suggest they were being silenced <laughs> okay. in the same way that Tommy Robinson and the like are these days, you know, and you can't go three minutes on social media without somebody appearing gaffer taped <laughs> to indicate their silence. But there was one member of the team which was Tracy Ann Oberman. I don't know if you know her, she's quite a well-known actress. She went on to be in, um, she was Dirty Den's girlfriend when he was resurrected from uh, canal death yes. uh, to uh, revive the nation's uh, interest in the show. And um, <laughs> didn't really work, but she was his girlfriend. And uh, I don't know whether she was called Filthy Fenella or something. I, can't, <laughs> I don't follow the show that closely, but I don't know everyone has to be uh, alliterative and criminal. Yeah. But... Um, Anyway, she was Alcoholic in it, and candy. the three of us, work, the work. three uh, men, because it's a three to one, because yeah. that's the correct ratio for men to women in comedy, as you probably know, and um, <laughs> as we've approximated this evening yeah, as best yeah. as we can. And, um, <laughs> if you include and the, three, <laughs> the three men, which was me, Chris Pavlo, and Dave Lamb, all had gaffer tape on, and Tracy was doing her makeup. It was quite funny. She was like oblivious to the kind of serious, okay. kind of, you know, subversive nature of the show. That was the joke. I couldn't find a copy of it, and it, was, and it annoyed me. But it ran for eight series, that, and we only pulled it because it was... Um, uh, we made a TV episode, which is obviously... Everyone who works on radio, as you know, is basically just trying to get on television and is pretending in the meantime that they like the adorably sort of clubbable, uh, rather low-pressure sort of nature of radio, yeah. and they're actually clawing their way out like a rat through a human skull, you know? But... Um, <laughs> They, we made a TV pilot, and the uh, controller of BBC One resigned before she could look at it, and, uh, and a new one came in, and that, of course, as everyone knows, means it's That's death, because they just clear the desk, and they don't want any leftovers from the previous administration, which is understandable, so it died, and so we all moved on. You know? yeah. but, um, Dave That's... Lamb got a job now, is mainly known as the voice of Come Dine With Me, he's the narrator of that. He's a Patcham man. Um, which is a, 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 a province to the north of Brighton, okay, uh, yes. sort of up into the, um, into the Redwoods um, on the A27. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he and his daughter Betty live up there, and, um, and his wife, whose name escapes me. And, uh, <laughs> and I think you really have to put yourself in the position of naming You could just say <laughs> his wife. I can't come up with she's called, she's going to listen. Pavlo, I think he's still with the Radio Theatre uh, yes, company okay. and has uh, quite a lot of buy to let in the Finsbury Park area, so he's relaxed about it. Really. <laughs> It's good to know how the, the old team yeah, are doing. You know, I mean, that's happened to me. It's okay, basically. It's, it's happened to me so but many Richard times. Richard was, he was, they, all the writers attempted vainly to take him into different and interesting sort of areas as a character, okay. ignoring my incredibly limited acting range. <laughs> it was basically me. I was just doing him as me. But he was roughly based on Chris Morris in On the Hour and okay. um, Day to Day, but it was an actual topical show. That was its only twist, you know. But it okay. was all based on that, basically. Every okay. nine, nine, 90, 95% of comedy is essentially parasitical, isn't it? If it not is. Not you know. It's stuff that I've created. Yes, that yeah, is the thing. Exactly, that's, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's the <laughs> And I get none of the money for it. I embedded Alan Partridge. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> so it's... I don't know if you need that. Um, so what should we talk about? Well, um... Uh, let's talk about quiz shows first. I love, I love quiz shows, and okay. you've done quite a lot. 
you've done uh, quite a lot of the TV quiz shows. Do you mean panel games? Well, or... no, no, proper. Oh, proper quiz shows. Yeah, no, shows. you're right about that. No, I don't do panel. I'm not very good on panels, but I'm, oh. I have done the proper quiz shows. You've done yeah, the celebrity right. mastermind. You've celebrity won celebrity mastermind. mastermind. Yep. How many points did you get out of matter of interest? On I matter to win. I think it was 33, but I'm oh, not 33. sure. 33. I got 34. I, oh, you got what? 34. Was it 34? Yeah, and I came well, second. Then. Seriously, who yeah. won then that round? Uh, Hillary Kay. These people I thought you were going to say Hitler then. That Hitler. Was really <laughs> <laughs> came back. And his special subject was... The more I hear about him, <laughs> the less... <laughs> <laughs> what, what was his special his subject? His special was himself. The Jews <laughs> and what they're up to. <laughs> <laughs> Problematic for the question setters, that. Probably why he got some easy ones. So, <laughs> what, <laughs> what was your subject? I then? did Rasputin. You did Ernest Shackleton, I believe. Yeah, I did. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So and I, I read three books about that. Yeah. I properly triangulated him. I was interested in it anyway, but it gave me a bit of a spur, and I really became quite well informed. And I, to be honest, I could have easily answered every question from the Wikipedia page. I was so <laughs> over. In, I think the thing is, when you do a difficult, a, a, an academic-ish yeah. subject, they don't know where to set it. Most of the people go on there, and they, they do question. There was Dr. Alice Roberts, paleoanthropologist yes. of TV fame, went on very highly, you know, proper doctor and um, PhD. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, but she's entitled to use the name if she <laughs> wants it. And uh, <laughs> she needs to be quite so snippy about it. But anyway... <laughs> She chose the Moomins. Right. The mo you know, children's yeah. finished uh, fairy tales because people like to undersell their intellect. And I was like, fuck that. Yeah. I am bright and I will demonstrate <laughs> this. <laughs> and so they didn't know where to set the questions. And so yeah. I think it was advantageous. I Possibly did a lot. you found the same I, I thing. I did a lot. I mean, yeah. I read two very thick books on Rasputin. Yeah. And, I learned... and the song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the song was... They all, they all came from the song. I learned the names of the two police officers. Who very, I don't know them now, but like I didn't speak Russian, so I had to learn everything phonetically. I learned the names of the two police officers that arrested the killers on the day or yeah. who, who were there when they came in. They killed they him did, twice. They did not they... go that far. It did not go that far. Did they deep. poison him and shoot him? Or well, something? I, you know, I wrote a play. Oh, you've about got it. a theory about it as and well. I don't, I don't think any of it happened. Any of the, oh, any really? Of, well, because it's nonsense. What, what right. The, the actual story is, is like a pop boiler thriller sort of thing. So he was building his own mythos, you think? Well, I think, I think Felix Yusupov, who uh, killed Rasputin, uh, or was involved in it, I think he was, it was a front thing, and then he made it seem more, you know, to, to make him more romantic and like he'd done yeah. a big bit of thing and to create was the myth of Was he the lover of, of the Russian queen, though? That's no, the I don't question. think. He wasn't I don't on that either, was. really. He didn't, well, I mean, he wasn't really in Moscow either, which is what Boney it is, yeah. to Moscow St. chicks. He was such right? a lovely... Yeah, St. Yeah, Petersburg. Yeah. He did go across to Moscow. He does famously not scan well, does it? St. No, <laughs> <laughs> Petersburg chicks. Uh, and he wasn't that much of a lovely dear. I mean, there's, I, I have a bit more sympathy for Rasputin than, the, than most of the historians do, right. but he was still uh, not a nice man. He would have been... I think he would have been me too in this era. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it might have been Operation u and Would I think it would be more been like one of those Jerry Falwell or one of those guys who yeah. try and use their religious affiliations yeah. to obscure, yeah. A little bit, but I think he might, been, he might have been, he might have been sincere, he might have been sincere, but he certainly got corrupted. But he was, so, he was, he was stabbed in like 1914 or something before yeah. and like had to run across a, a, a village holding his guts in and so, right. and nearly died that time, but then he, yeah. so like he was. So that got the sort of, you can't be stopped yeah. kind of myth going. And then yeah. I think they made up the rest of it. Because it doesn't yeah. make sense, no. Simon, that he was shot in the head and then got up. That does not no. make sense. No. Why don't you think about it? And the Even Russian bullets. <laughs> yeah. Well, historians <laughs> swallowed it. Uh, there's a theory that the, uh, the, British, uh, the British Secret Service killed him who, and, and Yusupov was a friend I don't know if you, this is what you came for. Um, <laughs> you get what you get, you get what you get. I can imagine John Humphreys drumming his fingers impatiently <laughs> as well. Do you have an answer, though, boy? Because <laughs> he's Welsh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he's Lovely rug, but, this, by the way. Did you, do you bring this around with you? No, this is... No, they this can't is... see it, most of them, can they? Because no. they're down in the Salisbury. I've got a nice rug. I'll be honest with you. I've lived in Brighton 12 years. I did not realise that you could just hire out the theatre world on a Sunday evening for your yeah. own vanity projects like this. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've been cheating myself. <laughs> Brilliant. Packed to the rafters. Well. <laughs> the, just like last week. Packed to the rafters. <laughs> I think last week's audience went out and said, you've got to come and see this thing, and then bang, it sold out yeah, so yeah. fast this week. It's been insane. Uh, Krypton Facts, you've done... I mean, Krypton Facts yeah. was the first one. That was my break into television. That uh, gave me it? the first taste of it, actually, right. yeah. But it also gave me my first insight into what you would well know about television, which is that there's an awful lot of waiting. And it, normally, if you do a game show or a panel game or a quiz show, yeah. you know, you wait for a bit, and then you're on, and then you've done it. But yeah. with the Krypton Factor, they shoot 
like as many as four different sections over the course of a weekend. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. really kind of modular, intrusive, breaking up. And it's all done up in um, Granada land, you yeah. know, um, uh, central Manchester, most of it, but the, 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 the assault course, you know, you are literally blindfolded and chucked in the boot of a Sierra and, uh, and driven out to some waste ground because they don't want you to know where that is. You need to be disorientated. And to be honest, the, on, the, on the last one, Gordon Burns had developed laryngitis. So we all went up there and there was like a six hour wait and then we informed he, he couldn't do it. And so oh we all God. went back down again and had to book out another weekend. So on the, on the final, this is all on uh, YouTube if you want to see it. They did, I think it was the only series where they did this. Instead of just having a series of rounds where you won points and they tallied up the points at the end and that was the winner, the first half of each programme, you won points and then you spent them on advantages in the super round. So okay. you basically bought kind of, you could eliminate certain rounds. A bit like buying the Joker, basically. You could eliminate certain rounds or were certain they, challenges. You know. It's sort of like, who wants to be a millionaire? They were trying to yeah, uh, get Yeah, I, I think they were desperately trying to rejuvenate the format. It didn't yeah. work, and I think that was the last series. So the, the super round was like part physical and part kind of mental agility. So there was a sort of, you know, there was like a kind of aerial runway, and then you land in a maze and fight your way out of it and everything. It's and one section, you, uh, you had to break codes... Um, and you work out what the code was. And it was fairly straightforward. It was like you had to hit the keyboard letter that was prior, like you hit F, if you, yes, S, if you want T to appear, just that simple. And then these words would come up, and once you'd done that, you ran off through the lasers or whatever. And I thought I'd done all four, but one of them I'd got wrong. I'd spelled a single letter out. I headed off, not having completed that round, climbed up Krypton Mountain and flourished <laughs> my big yellow K at the top like a complete planet. And was, was sadly informed by Gordon Burns wow. that I had um, been disqualified because I had failed to complete, you know, round three of the super, you know. And I had, to, I really thought I had won at that point oh. and I was going to be catapulted into the stratosphere, you know. Wow. And, uh, was Gordon Burns sad or was he, like, quite smug about the fact you'd messed up? Was he I like... think he felt that, yeah, his system had worked. It yeah. was a kind of, there was, <laughs> some, there was some degree of satisfaction. But there was also a woman called... Penny something who was the co-host of that. Says, I don't, does anyone remember that? She's quite quite good looking. I don't know this. I think you drank this. Like, she looked a bit like the Penny's... Icelandic woman that does the book program. What's her <laughs> name on the radio? <laughs> <laughs> Who's the one? Very husky voice. Very Mariella husky. Frostra. Voice. Mariella Frostrup. Yeah, she okay. looked a bit like Mariella Frostrup. Okay, Slightly Smith. more healthy appetite than Mariella Frostrup, <laughs> but. Uh... <laughs> anyway, she was the one who actually informed me about That's... it. But yeah. Gordon was off in the back there. <laughs> Another fly in the trap. Wow. <laughs> but yeah, so that was disappointing. But that was my first taste of pitting myself, you know, against yeah. challenges on... And I liked it, I'll be honest with you. Was I that you as a celebrity or was that you as a... No, that was person? me completely. I was a juggler and writer of erotic fiction. Yeah, well, I got that. I saw my, this. Uh, credit. I saw yeah. this. So, well, A, I can't imagine you as a juggler. I mean, the juggler is more surprising than the erotic fiction, yeah. I have to say. You can do the both at once. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do any erotic fiction about jugglers? Very, very fitting Harlequin <laughs> outfit. Yeah. That, uh... Then he grabbed her breasts, <laughs> threw one up. Yeah. <laughs> Club swapping. <laughs> so, are you juggling on the streets of... I used to, I didn't Luton juggle, I didn't get paid for my juggling skills. I made juggling balls and then taught people how to juggle and then okay. I'd sell them, a bit like the merch after yeah. the show. Yeah, and um, that was the, the, the business model, really. I, I'd learned to do this in Australia. I, I travelled around Australia, sort of took a gap year, but I was in my mid-20s, so I gave up a job and had about a grand that I'd saved up and I flew to Karachi um, to uh, get things sort of underway. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, and which was not quite as much of a war zone as it, as it has been in the interim, but it was, you know, and I left on the day that Margaret Thatcher had resigned from government, so it felt like the end of an era, a good time to go. And I basically worked my way through East Asia, India and Asia and what have you, on, on, on very sort of like dollar a day kind of basis, and by the time I got to Australia, I was out of cash, and somebody showed me how to make juggling balls, and basically what you do is you, you cut off the about the top third of a, of a large mineral water bottle. Yeah. And then you, you get a balloon and you stretch its neck over the, the neck of the, of the water bottle. And then you get a, a regular measure of millet, birdseed, which you pour into the funnel. Yeah. And then you have to put your face over the, the water bottle like that and blow into it so that your breath goes through the grain, expands the balloon, the grain falls into the balloon, and then you stop blowing 
and it forms nice little sort of, a, you know, like an anarchist bomb from the ni- yeah. 1890s, you know, and then you snip the neck off and cut the neck off a couple of other balloons and fold them over the top, and then you, the fourth balloon, you cut some holes in in a different colour, put that over the top, and you've got this lovely spot. It would go with your jumper. It's that it same sort of aesthetic, yeah. you know, that kind of, you know, crazy like a dragon's egg kind of thing. And you could make, if you've got a good system going, and once you took, the only thing was you would have a permanent red mark around your face from the water bottles. But is if that you, why you've yeah. got the goatee now? Is just yeah, to cover exactly. up that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Looked like you'd been star. rimming a pig, you know. Yeah. But apart from that. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a lot of effort for some juggling, but I mean, if you're yeah, going to yeah, get you something could sell useful, the juggling yeah. balls, they would sell for about five quid a pack, and they mm. were probably about ten pence to make. Right. The, the balloons I buy in bulk, and the millet would, you know, big yeah. sacks. So then I put them all in a pram and put them in the back of the of the uh, of the van yeah. and drive it to Guildford, Guildford High Street, which is a lovely picturesque high street in Surrey. I'm sure you know it, and you can yeah. see the, the, the like the cathedral in the distance. And loads of posh girls go into town on a Saturday, and they're always going to a party that evening. Oh, we'll get some of those for Demelza. It'll be hilarious. <laughs> and so you give them a little lesson, and they buy some juggling balls. And I tell about two hundred quid a day, which was fine on nice. virtually no costs, you yeah. know. And that was my living essentially. And then I wrote porn during the week. <laughs> 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 and what was that? Was that for magazines? That was, was that? Yeah, yeah, readers' letters for. Right. Um, there was one called Parade, which yes, was quite. It was direct, specifically aimed at Squaddies Parade, right? And it had a lot of Union Jacks. It was a bit like an early form of Brexit propaganda, yeah. essentially. <laughs> but, uh, and um, and so yeah, and there were one or two others. There was Razzle, not to Razzle. be confused with. Uh, you know, no, sorry, it was Rustler, not to be confused with. Razzle. Everyone thinks it was Ra- because Razzle was that was had a cult following for some reason, didn't it? Yeah. Razzle, but I don't know why. But yeah, Rustler was a rip off of Hustler, which was the big American right. one, you know. Fiesta. Uh, that was the first porn mag we was, got hold of. I don't think I did that one, no. I did... It was just all cars in there. It was rubbish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what well, is funny was the Fiesta and Escort. Do you remember yes. that? They yeah. were... It did... It did kind of get... Wasn't that weird? What a weird time yeah. it was. Yeah. You, again, you wouldn't be... At this. We've gone very 20th century in this podcast already, but you wouldn't be able to imagine a period where you would... The only time you could see a bare lady was finding under a bush in, a, in Shippen Woods. Oh, basically. the big bag of... It, it was um, yeah. Farm Lane, brackets, unadopted, was the place where we... It was a little, <laughs> like, it was... The, the backs of some posh people's houses came onto a sort of, uh, like, a, an unmade-up road, yeah, yeah. And that was full of bushes of porn. Yeah. It was... It, it almost occurred to you that they might be naturally occurring there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I made someone vote them. I just yeah. grew. <laughs> But like, we, had a, we had a copy of Fiesta that we just... Like, you yeah. would pass it around your mates so, like, and give them what you were doing with but it. But it was is... the... It wasn't so much the fact that somebody had previously used it. Yeah. That it was the... It, the, it was the damp that had got to the... Pe- that's, I, for years, I associated erotic arousal with that kind of musty, you know... <laughs> the <mildew>. Newsprint, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 very debasing, yeah. yeah. Took a long time in therapy to get through that. <laughs> and then I, you know, took my revenge by contributing to it in, in the dying days of its economic viability. But um, <laughs> Leonard Holdsworth was the editor. He had, um, he had a number of interests. I think he had some more legitimate publishing interests as well. But right. he, he was like a commissioning editor for Confessions and Letters and so on. And somehow he owned a house just off Cheney Walk in, in, in Chelsea, a full, full-scale townhouse, like right. in a very desirable neighbourhood with that. And his wife would come down with a little tray with, um, you know, cakes and, and tea while we were discussing what the next batch of letters should be. Yeah. And so did you use your own experiences in the letters? No, no. Had you, were you a virgin? The first three, and <laughs> yeah. then that was it, yeah. No, I was a bit too over-imaginative, really. That was yeah. the main notes I got. Get on with it, Evans, for that <laughs> sake, you know. They don't want to know all about 17th century France. <laughs> <laughs> the specific duties of a chevalier. We can dispense with that, you know. But I felt you've got to build up some erotic tension. Yeah, Otherwise, it doesn't work, you know. I agree. It doesn't I, work for me without I that. don't watch porn. I think we've established that last week. I don't, I don't <laughs> There was one time that I got caught doing it. Uh, but... If there's going to be a little bit of a story to get yeah. you in there. I must admit as well, one of the I've sometimes gone back over it, but I liked writing them from the perspective of the woman. I liked putting my... When I read now about these non-binary... You know, Sam Smith, who says he's non-binary and he needs pronouns, I think we're all a bit non-binary, mate. You know, this is not a new thing. I quite like going into the mind and imagining, and I could find that quite... Did you see that Black Mirror episode? I thought that was quite interesting where yeah. they explored that. It was called something Vipers or something? Yes, yes. Two, uh, two grown men who inhabit 
uh, avatars on yeah. a video game and then have sex with one another. You could do that kind of stuff with readers' letters, and it was quite, and, you know, from my point of view, they didn't know. They, they were completely sold, of course. They, <laughs> they were believing it all, but, yeah, yeah it was quite... In, in a way, it was healthy, and in another way, it was probably, um, you know, uh, like uh, sublimating things that I should have been kind of going, right, let's actually explore what it would be like to actually have sex. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it would be, again, a bit, weren't the main readers of these things. I can't imagine there were many adults really reading the magazine. Maybe there were. I don't were. know. I don't know. mainly I teenage boys? I honestly don't know who the, or, like, the audience that you were aiming for. The letters are the things that, that stay the with teenage. me. You know, that was the yeah. thing. The, 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 the pictures are all a bit scary. I, I don't know. I mean, I a lot of the... We get letters in. Yeah. From squatters in particular. Parade, right. we get them in. Um, often in Ireland, I had about three different stories. One of them with a full-size, like, A4, coloured-in <laughs> illustration of him and his mate doing a house-to-house, -house, I think it was called, you know, just in, in Belfast or whatever, and a bird opens the door with, a, you know, stockings and suspenders, yeah. and it's all full-on carry-on, sort of, and here we go. And then, and then there's the uh, sergeant comes around, and they, like, he's clambering down the drainpipe. <laughs> I mean, it was obvious nonsense. Yeah. But the fact that he'd registered that these stories were obvious nonsense, and I could do one of those. And so my editor gave it to me and said, see if you can you know, trick this up and... <laughs> that was much harder than writing an original story. <laughs> Making that one work. Yeah. I don't know if you've, you've done yeah. this, like script editing for other people's yeah, sitcoms yeah. and stuff. I do this occasionally, you know. Much, much harder to kind of... I mean, not to say that they're rubbish, but yeah. to get into somebody else's fantasy yeah. and think, well, what, you know, why, would, why did he find this... This is a bit sad, isn't it, really? <laughs> you know, but, you, tragedy porn, that may still be a, a market for that. I don't know, but... Yeah, well, I'm very obsessed with uh, sex robots, and I know you've yeah. talked about them on your, ra your radio show. About and at the Battle of Ideas a couple of years ago. Well, yeah. Last year, in fact, yeah, yeah, I was on a panel discussing that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that, it's sort of interesting the way that technology is going to take mm. all this stuff, isn't it? I mean, like, I that, was... that, that Charlie Brooker uh, thing yeah, is a yeah. great example of that. I wasn't convinced about sex robots until I saw... The bloke on not the robot, but yeah. like his genuine obvious. Did you see that on the this morning? Yeah, or whatever? Yeah. yeah. That was really weird. I mean, he really is in love with that robot, yeah. isn't he? And well, is um, that weird? <laughs> <laughs> See, it's quite that, weird. Is that wrong? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. It's interesting at that precise moment where people are discussing what it, what is it, what is gender, what is it that's specific to a male or a female sexuality? Is it? Is it just the, eight, the organs that excite you, or is it the, the, the female end of the spectrum, the, the um, personality or the character or the power or whatever? This, you, these things, and then the men are just yeah. simply have visual triggers. Well, it seemed to suggest this bloke <coughs> that, the, that some men, at least, have such basic, you know, animal triggers. They're not, he's not much better than that monkey that used to used to hold on to a towel while it was drinking milk. Do you remember that one, the behaviourist? <laughs> where they, where they, where they realised... monkeys, mate. I'm it was one of those early experiments where they yeah. realised that monkeys, and then presumably humans, like in Romanian orphanages and stuff, monkeys w would prefer um, the... Uh, greatly prefer a, a milk dispenser in a cage that had a sort of furriness. Okay. Like, it was vaguely like a female monkey. Right. To the extent that if they couldn't, if they put like the, the, the furriness and the milk in the same cage, the monkey spends most of the time holding onto the furriness, just a rag, really, you yeah. know, and then occasionally will go over to the milk, but will still like hold onto the, the, the thing. That was basically that bloke on this morning. He was, <laughs> uh, he'd attached himself to this silicon. Uh, robot, but you know, she, on TV she was queer. I mean, I th you know, I think Schofield was a little bit, you know, <laughs> ready to go. Yeah, I think he was. Yeah, <laughs> he was fired up. <laughs> and uh, I can't remember what's her name. Is it Hol Holly Willoughby? Holly Willoughby. Willoughby, Willoughby. Yeah, is, I can never, is it, yeah. is it Willoughby? Honestly, <laughs> it is Holly Willoughby. I think Holly Willoughby. What about a Holly Willoughby? Yeah, Holly Willoughby. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, she you know, was, she was jealous. Way. She was getting quite. She was getting you know, jealous. Yeah. Wasn't the wife involved in that? Was the the guy with that sex robot? Yeah, yeah. His wife, his wife sitting the other side, and she doesn't. And mind. then she sort of goes, yeah, we she will watch telly together, and then sometimes the sex robot reads the children um, bedtime stories. <laughs> apparently, you have to be quite careful. It's on the right setting, I would imagine. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, you'll all be doing it in the future. Don't you worry. You'll all be there. You'll all, you'll all it's funny because Brighton is quite traditionally. I don't know if I'm addressing an, an entire. How many of you are actually literally Brighton rather than sort of coming in? Yay! Yeah, not not like an overwhelming majority, maybe. But Brighton is, um, of course, 
traditionally and famously very uh, progressive and liberal in its uh, attachment or approach to sexual, uh, uh, you know, marginalised sexual pursuits or whatever. But I've seen very little of this in Brighton. I see very little evidence of this. I don't know whether that's because it's for people who live in places that aren't so liberal. So maybe if you're, you know, if it's okay to just walk around in your gimp suit anyway, you know, yeah. there's, there's, you don't need that. They're all having sex with people here in Brighton. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everything goes. You don't need a robot. Way behind the cutting edge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, oh, you know, they'll get better. The robots will get better. And then it'll reach a point. The Gemma Chan window yeah <laughs> he'll pass through that and then you'll all be all over the, it the what window the Gemma Chan she's in the robots the, oh is she the okay humans, right the, uh, is that is that she like a, an example of the uncanny valley <laughs> have you heard of the uncanny valley no anyone know this yeah, see, lots of people yeah some people have done the yes. reading <laughs> the uncanny valley is the um it's the stage of authenticity or the convincing simulation where it's so nearly right but isn't quite right, right, that it makes you feel weird. There was a Tom Hanks film called The Polar Express, which yes. was neither animation nor a movie. It was sort of the actors, but they'd been drawn on a bit. And it made everyone kind of go, no, that's all weird and wrong. It's like that. And that's yeah. where they're at at the moment. That's okay. where the sex robots are. Yeah. If they were just, you know, people, most people would rather fuck a fleshlight than, than a sort of... Yeah. You know, nearly but not quite human woman. It's this yeah. is something a bit too weird. I mean, about it's that. sort of embarrassing. It's embar yeah. I'd be embarrassed. At, I mean, sort of, yeah, I joke about it. But if someone forced me to do it, yeah, it would be it would be an embarrassing exactly. thing to have to go yeah. through with. Yeah, at the moment, but soon it will be awesome. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Soon it'd be amazing. And... Maybe they'll be programmed with my stories. That yeah. might be. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wonder if they ever get the where they ever get to the position where they can do sort of virtual reality and you can go yeah. back into your life and relive situations and do them right. Do them right, my God. Like that Richard Curtis film. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not like Grand Hog Day, but of yeah. just shagging. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I mean, it could be other stuff as well, but no one would use it for the other side. Just want, to, <laughs> just want to see if I can leave that job on a high note, having done all my work right. It'd be great to go back to an actual situation yeah. like when you were 21 and And then you could and... sort of shine a specific woman's face <laughs> onto the robot. Yeah, so, but no, yeah. it just would be essentially time travelling in your own life yeah. through virtual reality. It'd be so real. I guess it's the holodeck and the Star Trek, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. But yeah. just jagging. Yeah. Rather, rather, yeah. Than, <laughs> rather than going back into the past. <laughs> you with me, Brian? Are you very, very repressive? This guy's double thumbs up from this guy. <laughs> The people who like this sort of stuff are all at Romish tonight. That's the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, what, have you ever let down a squirrel? I let down a squirrel this week. Have you ever let down a squirrel? What, what abseiling sort of thing? <laughs> or, uh... <laughs> well, Dave, you interpret it however you like. I feel I should have killed a squirrel. Oh, um, the roadkill thing? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, okay. But, you yeah. know, it could be yeah. in another scenario where a squirrel needed your help. Oh, just you disappointed just a squirrel generally. Yes. <laughs> well, there's the sex thing that we were just talking yeah. about. I didn't want to go straight back there. Yeah. If I could go back and pleasure that squirrel, knowing yeah. what I know now. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's yeah. unlikely. I, I do... Um, I have killed roadkill deliberately, yeah. Have you? But not with a sudden swerve. The instinct is to swerve away, definitely, and then you have to reverse and do it properly. Right. Um, which is tiresome, but, yeah, I think it's probably best to do that overall, yeah. I was, um, I was driving through Australia once on that same gap year thing. We were in a VW van driving across the great western desert. Yeah. And, uh, and that is like a video game. And kangaroos just appear out of nowhere at night. And, and all you have is your own headlights. There's no street lighting at all and a very starry sky. And then suddenly, bing, 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 you know. Yeah. <laughs> and one struck our van and, and virtually wrote it off. It was, right. uh, and that was a huge... Like, that was felt like you had slain, a, you know, almost your own equal, really. I yeah. mean, he, he would have stood about that tall. So in order to honour him, we butchered him. And, <laughs> um, and we ate him. Gradually over the next week, and I felt that was, you know, that was that made sense. Where of the, did you keep him in the he desert? Was, he was dangling off the back of, in uh, his limbs were attached to uh, various hooks, and you know, we had that. Well, it was one of those old VW campers with the rear window is on a hinge. So didn't you could it get sort of, too hot? Didn't it? did you cure the meat or something? Yeah, yeah. well, you you give it a good, you know, it expose it to a naked flame, yeah. you know, to get the flies off before you started. Yeah. <laughs> It wasn't that good eating either, I've got to say. I think you probably need to marinate them or something. Yeah. I'm not sure. I have eaten tough. kangaroo. I have eaten yeah. kangaroo in Australia. But, we yeah. kept his bull sack for a purse, and that actually <laughs> that worked quite well. I mean, that's the thing you can buy in uh, tourist shops. Yeah. 
this is I'm teaching the grandmother to suck eggs here at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Got a collection of them. But uh, yeah, so that you wasn't. You were tempted thing. to make a juggling ball. I out kept of it. his. <laughs> I kept his paw yeah, yeah. as a sort of, you know, like the, like the, like some. The r- yeah. Lucky thing. R- yeah, no, no not, not like a wanky thing. Like a. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you use a dead kangaroo, it's <laughs> no, like another can. kangaroo is doing it. <laughs> yeah, I would. No, it was like a sinister sort of. You know, I wanted to do it on top of a cane, ideally, yeah. or something like that. You know, God. the kangaroo's paw. <laughs> <laughs> I see you are learned in the ways, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's quite, but yeah, that's the, the biggest thing. Like ever this. They don't like us talking about this. I would happily slaughter seagulls. I, I know that's a divisive issue <laughs> here, but my God, we had one. It laid its eggs out, so we have a little sort of the flat window on top of a sort of um, bay window, you know, in the, the floor below and outside the attic room. Um, it was right there, you know, you could see it. And the, and the bloke goes, you can't touch them, they're protected. So once they've had eggs, you're not allowed to touch them. The only thing you can do, he said, this is from the pest control guy, <laughs> is you can drip paraffin onto the egg and that will seal it and the bird inside will suffocate. Oh. And that is legal in a way that just shoving it off with a broom isn't for some reason. <laughs> I do not know why. It's well, horrible, it's isn't it? I mean, that's cruel, properly but... sadistic, yeah. yeah. But I could, you know, I've got a rifle, an air rifle. I could have just been three feet away from it and just ended the whole thing right there, but you're not allowed to because they're a protected species because they were here first. But um, <laughs> <laughs> they are very annoying around here, although it, it, mainly when they act in unison with a, a, a green control council to maintain a healthy level of overfill <laughs> from the bins. If, if you keep the bins under control, the gulls will follow as a rule. Yeah. But, you know. That's interesting. Yeah. That's, that's the main, that's the squirrel of the sea. <laughs> <laughs> You're not the first comedian I've had on who's had, Rob Rouse had a, a sheep, I think he did a routine about it, you might have seen it. Where what, he, that he killed? It, well, he ran over and then put it in his boot thinking he could, I think it was a yeah, sheep. Yeah, you've got to let somebody else, if you run it over, the bloke behind you can yeah, have yeah. it. Yeah, those are the rules. Yeah, I think yeah. he might, someone else might run over, but he put it in his boot on a hot day and then oh, it right. basically exploded in his car. Oh, blimey. <laughs> with that, with the, because yeah. they have a lot of gastric juices, yeah. don't they? What was it? Uh, Mer- not America. Far from the madding crowd. In an early scene, the um, the sheep are all swelling up like oh, balloons, yeah. and he has to go around punching them. <laughs> Seemed to me a really surreal thing to <laughs> sort of insert into a Dorset story. That, but um, yeah, but I will just mention by the way with the seagull thing. Apparently, a mate of mine who's a, uh, a an established uh, maritime expert says that sailors will leave a snake out on the deck um, to keep albatross and stuff away from the boat because they just don't like it, so they won't settle. And a a rubber snake can be quite effective, but I didn't have one, so I did put out a dinosaur (laughs) (laughs) on the ledge the following spring, and it did work. So obviously something in their their genetic memory. (laughs) They might have just thought, well, the dinosaurs got here first, you know. (laughs) It's only fair. Yeah, yeah. So I'll ask you, I'll ask you the emergency question that I've been asking everyone okay. recently, which is, and you might have an answer to this, I think you, you're... I'm adopting man. a Jacob rees Mog body language for yeah. a moment. Uh, yeah. up a bit That's OK. Um, if you could take, if you could, you're allowed to take one item from a museum or art gallery and keep it as your own anywhere in the world, yeah. any art gallery, any museum, any artefact, any painting, you're allowed one thing and it's yours, what thing would you take from the world's well. treasures? My favourite painting at the moment is one I encountered randomly and unexpectedly at the Prado in Madrid recently. We went there because my wife is a big fan of Velasquez and had just read a book about um, a a Velasquez painting that went missing for maybe a couple of hundred years and then was rediscovered and she thought this book was amazing and so we had to go and see the painting. And tucked away just unexpectedly, there was a painting called Agnes Dei, the Lamb of God, of a lamb being uh, sort of tied up and ready for slaughter that had been on the front cover of a CD I have of Bach's Matthew Passion. And I loved the CD cover, but I'd never known where the painting was or anything. And then there it was, and it was absolutely breathtaking. It's not very big, it's about that big, and it's sort of bathed in a golden light, and it's a really beautiful painting. So I might have that. Okay. Or I might have the mermaid from the Booth Museum on Dyke Road, which is a very <laughs> impressive fake artefact from the, uh, the South Indies Seas, I oh, believe. Oh, cool. Yeah. 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 Have you been to the Booth Museum? I have not. No, I haven't been to that You've one. been to the Booth Museum? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Of course That's you have. an important local. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there are some, it's a great, it was established by a Victorian eccentric, and he has some really excellent tableau set up there. There's one of a seagull, I think it is, or, or at least some kind of large raptor. 
plucking an eyeball out of a dead lamb, in fact. Okay. It would go quite well with my <laughs> Lamb of God thing. You haven't gone under yeah. the whole yeah. theme of this show. Yes, exactly. Stay <laughs> very much in cruelty to animals. You would think <laughs> nothing of running over a squirrel <laughs> after a time in there. No, it's a good one, that, yeah. yeah. They have a badger that was in uh, Harry Potter as well. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure where. <laughs> Just running around, <laughs> fighting people. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know who I am? I was in Harry Potter, <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> And I'll see what other merch questions we've got. There's plenty more to talk to you about, but we'll just have a little... Uh, well, uh, what's your favourite... This is for, uh, for kids, actually, but right. I'll ask you. What's your favourite type of dinosaur? Would you like one as a pet? What would be the potential drawbacks? Mm. Is that a foreskin joke? Uh, <laughs> uh, favourite dinosaur? Favourite dinosaur? I mean, we're still in the same area. Yeah, I mean, I keep anticipating the questions, don't I? It's a, I think... I think the thing with dinosaurs is you, you wouldn't necessarily want your favourite one as a pet because the thing that makes you them a favourite when, when you're young is their fearsome nature, yeah. isn't it, which also rules them out. I being... think if they were your pet, you would be able to command them as well. Oh, I think OK. They show sort of loyalty to yeah. you and you alone. They yeah. would, you'd get them from an egg, they'd hatch, they'd think you yeah. were their mother. It'd be like a little duck and then it was a Tyrannosaurus yeah. Rex. It would do whatever you want. You'd beat Imprinting, it I think it's called, isn't it? Yeah, yes. But we never know. Yeah. Well... I was never that fond of T-Rex. No. I always thought he looked ridiculously disproportioned. He was like a, uh, you know, uh, made up by some sort of sadomasochist. Yeah. Bit. I don't know. I quite like the, the larger sort of veggie ones, really. Yeah. yeah. I think quite a gentle, placid, a stegosaurus, possibly. I quite like the fact they have two brains. That always fascinated me. Apparently okay. they have a tail brain. Right. Although that, no doubt, is one of those things that has been since disproved. All yeah. the good stuff about dinosaurs gets... No, actually, that's not true. That didn't happen. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Stegosaurus, who apparently... Uh, this, is, this is the top dinosaur fact. Now, you might have heard this one, but it gets shared quite often on social media. The time difference between us and the T-Rex is less than the time difference between the T-Rex and the Stegosaurus. Yeah, Did you know that one? Yeah, I saw that the other day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah. Remember it, yeah. Has anyone want to whistle appreciatively? That's quite a... Yeah. <laughs> That is quite impressive, isn't yeah. it? In the same way that it's like longer now since um, uh, the Beatles' uh, Edwardian pastiche, Sergeant Peppers, than it was since the Edwardian era when they recorded Sergeant Peppers. That's quite disturbing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that is. Yeah. <laughs> Those are weird. They're getting old to terrible things. It's a bloody it's awful, awful thing. Awful. Although at least we haven't been destroyed by an asteroid yet, I suppose. <laughs> that, you know. I'm not a huge fan of dinosaurs anymore. I was obviously when I was a kid, but yeah. I think at some point. It's like a lot of things. You realise they're just thick. And I'm not that interested anymore in things that are just thick, yeah. you know. You're living in the wrong country. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what started it. I get enough dinosaur in my daily diet. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Um, good, let's have a look. Uh, oh, oh, you did a tweet the other day um, uh -oh. yeah. where you said that if you chew sugar-free gum whilst drinking coffee... Yes, this is my great <laughs> drink, it's dragon's like, den idea. It's yeah. like drinking sweet, it's like having sugar in your yeah, coffee. Yeah, I find it much... I've, don't, I've never found a sweetener that I can put in coffee that doesn't ruin it, but if I'm chewing a sugar-free gum while I drink the coffee, it's delicious and I don't is need sugar Is it not a it. little minty? Well, it probably is a little minty, but it probably means I like minty coffee. But, <laughs> <laughs> But I'd always, I, I don't like the taste of coffee, which is a problem, obviously, in Brighton, because it is essentially, you know, we have passed the, uh, the coffee uh, event horizon many years ago. <laughs> There's no non-coffee-based enterprise here now. You've either got coffee shops or you've got, like, barbers and things that will offer you a coffee as soon as you go in and you're expected <laughs> to drink coffee the whole time. And, um, and I don't really like coffee, no. you know, so I found that to find ways. Because if you just drink it in order to consume sugar, then, yeah. you, then you start your metabolic disorders. You, you don't know. have to drink it, though. You don't start eating chewing gum to make coffee. Yeah, just no. drink I tea. want it. I like, I like feeling overstimulated do most you? of the time. <laughs> yeah, I, do. I do, though. I mean, I am more of a coffee addict than anything else, really. I right. suppose there's other things have fallen away. I, I carried on smoking marijuana for about 20 years after I knew I didn't like it anymore. But I just, you know, the sort of peer pressure. But you come to Brighton and it's all about the coffee and I like the, yeah. like the feeling, don't like the taste. So. OK, well, that's fair enough. I could it? try enemas, of course. But yeah. um, incredible, over 100 coffee shops in Brighton and not a single one offers the coffee enema. Right. Uh, despite there's a quite a lot of, like, A-list role models that I've, apparently I think all the supermodels use it and stuff, yeah. don't they? You know, have you yeah. tried one? I have not done, I've never done an enema, I don't no. think, of any kind. Of, of any kind, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I've yeah. only done the basic ones, I mean, you know? <laughs> Just, yeah. No, I haven't done one of any. I would only do it for that purpose. But apparently it does work. Has anyone done one? Yeah? yeah? OK. <laughs> Proud. Are you doing it now? Is it true? Does it work? <laughs> yeah, gives you a bit of a rush, right? Yeah, focus. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'll try it. I will t- on your recommendation, <laughs> five stars. <laughs> I will give it a go. I drink a lot of coffee. Yeah. Does it come straight back out again? I suppose that's the first worry, is it? How far in do you have to get the nozzle? Let's get it about a finger's worth in. Right. Okay. And then it comes out about 15 minutes later. But under control? I mean, do you have a warning that it's coming or do you have to wear a diaper? It's like you're going to have a poo. Yeah. You go, oh, you do it in the bath anyway. Okay. Okay, so that's probably... It's like you're going to do a poo, you do it in the bath. That's not like... (laughs) That's like my son having a poo. That is not like... <laughs> that's not how I do my poops. God, I'd forgotten that. The poo's in the bath era. Did you use the thing that's intended for getting peas out of a saucepan? That's what we used I, to I use. Did it, the last time my son did it, my sister bought my daughter a game, which is a, a, a net with right. some fake poos. Oh, wow. Right, so they play with that in the bath. Yeah. And my son did a shit in the bath and my daughter thought it was the toy <laughs> and picked up the shit. I've kind of got to say, I feel like you've invited that. (laughs) (laughs) And so I then, she was freaked out by that, so then I just cleared it all out by hand. Yeah. And then a lot of it goes in the plug, and the plug had a lot of hair in it, because we'd never, I didn't really check the bath plug, and so it was like then getting feces strewn. I liked it, I love it. I I talked about this on another, another podcast, but I quite, that's the job, I quite like clearing out the hair trap. Well, Not I like getting so much, out the but... hair trap. It's been a while since there was poo in there, but yeah. it's funny, those things are never the worst jobs, actually, are yeah. they? It's like, we have a dog, and people go, oh, you have to pick up its poo, and I'm like, that really isn't in the top ten of the, of the annoyances, of, no. you know. It, it's, it, I would rather, as long as it's reasonably well set, it's actually quite satisfying. Yeah, it's, it's... If, you, if you get it right, there's a sort of, you know, flourish, <laughs> and then it's bagged and tied before they know what's happened. <laughs> and it's, it's a bit like an old-fashioned shopkeeper, you know, just William going for a six penny worth of, of gooseberry drops or something. <laughs> Is the broken ones for yeah. free? You know. It's very. I guess it's not the same here in the in the in town so much. But in my village, the Facebook page is just full of people annoyed about people doing their dog poo wrong. Yeah, right. Like people like quite a lot of people, and I am annoyed as well. How people, do you do it wrong? Well, you bag it up Granny and then leave. Not. Well, you bag it up and then leave the bag. Oh somewhere. yeah, no, that is wrong. I mean, that is just rude, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. But I think like then people argue that they're going to come back and get it, but they often don't. They don't, no. Uh, but also, don't do Just fucking carry it It's around. like, a mate of mine said to me, it's like James Bond and that first killing, you know, the first one's the toughest. The first one you walk away from is the toughest, and then it gets yeah. easy, and he's right. And I realised I did do it a couple of times because I didn't have bags with me, and I thought, yeah. no, this is wrong. Because yeah. it really is, it is it's horrible. Yeah. It's yeah. really horrible, and it's disease-ridden and everything. Yeah. So I am quite particular about that now, yeah. and I am quite, I'm, I'm pretty good on that. I have actually picked up other people's. Have you? Well, I've well if I'm out walking with the dog and I've got the bags anyway, and I see one, I, fuck it. I bury, the, if, they, if they're buriable, because I'm in the countryside, I will, with soil and stuff around yeah. us, it's, when you see them right next to the dog poo bin, yeah, that's yeah. When you kind of think this. I mean, in a way, I admire the guys who <laughs> let their, their dog shit. They think, no, I'm not even transferring. What they could them make to is them. they could make poo bags that had a sort of camo pattern yeah. and, and were biodegradable, and then you could just fling it and they would like yeah. settle out. You know, you could then you could get them some distance off the path. Yes. But they all seem to be sold in like vibrant colours, you know, yeah. like you might want to go clubbing with them or something. And so I don't you know. <laughs> It is. It is where I was. That the, my the greatest fear about having kids was the poo. That the poo yeah. would be a problem. And it's. I'm just. You know. Yeah. I'm so. That's all fine. So, oh, absolutely. Fine. I genuinely miss changing nappies as yeah. well. Changing come nappy, back, come a to really my house. good heavy nappy. <laughs> yeah. Because that was the thing. My wife would change them too soon, and that would deprive me of the pleasure of changing <laughs> a really heavy one. I say, let it build a little. Yeah. Come on. Do you think you're going to set up a business where you allow fathers who no longer can change the nappies of their own kids to come to your house and change your kids' nappies? I mean, that's a a bit dodgy, isn't it? But if if you said, are you doing it because you just miss being a dad of the... Yeah, I am. I only like changing the uh, urine. I mean, I do the other ones, but that's not enjoyable, you know. And that was always... That is terrifying, to be honest, when you have a daughter and you are wiping the anus. You know, there's that fear. Oh, mate, it's a bit like those fish that the Japanese cut up and eat raw but you have to get really close to the poison sack you know what i'm saying there's a oh, I'm really working around this area very carefully indeed didn't like that so much 
But yeah. a really good heavy, and then the really satisfying thing was you do it upstairs in her bedroom, yeah. and then drop it over the stairs <laughs> for whoever was downstairs to pick up. That was a thunk. That was a really good thunk onto the stairs. <laughs> Ah, oh, fucking marvellous. And also, of course, using the dirty ones as, um, to, you know, to protest against various municipal decisions and things, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, um... <coughs> yeah. So that was unexpectedly it was. fruitful. It was, it was good, but it was nice. Um, I, you know, we, I think you and I probably politically come at things from a slightly different angle, uh, but I, 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 for a while you were... I mean, there's, you were one of the only more. I don't think I don't know if you are really right right wing right wing, but as a comedian, you're more to the to the right. Than well, I mean, I think I, on that, just to you know, because it's a vaguely serious question. I think my favourite answer was probably the one that Stephen Fry uh, gave, which is that it's just interesting to play with different ideas mm -hmm. and not just kind of accept the orthodoxy that seems yes. to prevail at any given moment. My politics are not by any means set in stone, and I'm just, I'm always curious as to why people hold one view or another. And I can understand certain perspectives, you know, demanding, you know, certain uh, opinions, or yeah. they would influence those opinions. But mine wouldn't necessarily, so I would always think, well, is there another alternative point of view? And I think I did have a sort of, not quite an epiphany, but a, a moment about 10 years ago, probably through Twitter, when I'd accepted pretty much from university era that although I was a bit more instinctively white wing than most people in the comedy community, I accepted that probably the intellectual, um, uh, and, you know, the, the intellectual high ground in politics was occupied by the left, whereas the right were more kind of, you know, I suppose, sort of, well, that's all very well, but I want my, you know what I mean? That kind yeah. of like mindset. You think, oh, knuckle dragging skinhead thugs on the right and like intellect, and you have to, try and create a democracy in which everyone feels that they have a share and so on, the social contract. But still, let's be honest, the intellectuals have established that the left wing is the correct point of view. But through Twitter, I discovered genuine intellectual right wing thinkers. You know, people, not all of them like, entirely engaged with modern thought. Some, like Chesterton, for instance, who I've read quite a lot of now, who right. establishes perfectly coherent and I think legitimate ways of looking at society and, uh, and understanding it in ways that the progressive left have rather left behind. So I just kind of champion those views so that they get heard. But I'm not somebody who kind of feels very strongly that they can see, oh my God, if you would only listen to me, I can see how society would work. <laughs> I can mainly see that it's very, very difficult. Yeah, I, I sort of don't feel it's, I, I, I get what you're saying, and I don't think it's comedy's job necessarily no. to come up with answers, and it's comedy's job to point out what's stupid about everything. Yeah. <clears throat> I think it does become slightly problematic. And to be honest, most comedians aren't very political at all. And so there's plenty of actual... And they don't think it through very much. Yeah. But it gets to the point where on Radio 4 panel games, like the News yeah. Quiz, for instance, you just get four comedians all spinning the wheel in the same direction because it's much yeah. easier to get laughs that way. If there's a certain momentum, the flywheel is turning. Yeah. If you try and turn it back the other way and go, you know, then you, essentially you're jamming a spanner into the works. It's much easier to just keep spinning it. But, you know, a lot of people said Mock the Week, for instance, in, you know, which is not, again, terribly political, but to the extent that it does have targets, you know, in the build-up to the Brexit referendum, I don't think you heard a single person speak on behalf of what turned out to be half the country. And I think that, that disconnect that can occur there is quite dangerous, potentially. I think people want to see the BBC um, capable of, of, of offering them a balanced news and current affairs service, of course, but they also expect to see a certain amount of balance in light entertainment as well, to the extent, you know, even if 70% of it is, like, non-political at all, yeah. if the 30% of it that is political is just basically saying every Brexit voter is either a closet racist or doesn't even bother to say in the closet, then and it turns out 50% of the country feel that way, then actually there's a sort of... That is a sort of failure of, of, the, of the, uh, the network and of the job of comedy to some extent. You know, people should feel their, that their views are represented. They're paying yeah. their licence fee, you know. Yeah, I agree, but I think also... Not that I'm making my views up, but I just no. feel, well, you know, there are other points of view here. You yeah, know? but I mean, you know, but I, I think that whole thing of having to ascribe to one viewpoint and then you've got to go for everything yeah. is kind of crazy. No, not but, you, know, you so, personally so, happen. No, no, no. But, but it happens on both sides. So, like, and especially with Twitter, everything gets polarised now. And you, you, you know, yeah. I asked a question on Twitter last night that I thought was quite reasonable, and I'd be getting shit all day. Which one was uh, it? I don't want to talk about it. Cause yeah. I don't to, but it was, uh, you know, it was about one of those controversial subjects, but I don't think it was that controversial question yeah. and and then the people extrapolate from that question to you know yeah. then they're t within two tweets they're talking about something 
completely different. There thing. are you one or two subjects on Twitter yeah. that I don't even remotely discuss. No, well, I wish anymore. I had. You know, it probably was one of those. Yeah, you know, and I'll be probably know which one it is. <laughs> but, uh, you know, one or two comedians have been drawn in, and will probably never, you know, extricate themselves. Yeah. Now. But um, but you know, you should be able, you know, you should be able to discuss stuff, and you, and you should yeah. be able to say stuff you don't think. The thing that I found, out. I talked about this. There was another yeah. podcast which I hope you won't mind me mentioning. A guy called um, Stu uh, Goldsmith. Goldsmith yeah. yeah, no, the comedian's comedian. Where I talked about this, and how is it? Is it possible to be a right wing comedian? And I was saying the thing about being right wing isn't. It's not like about marching and and like kind of flushing minorities out and, and you know, bayonetting them in a ditch. It's about recognising that, that human nature is a real thing, you know, and that, and that to some extent our experience of civilization is cyclical rather than purely progressive. We're not all getting better. We're not moving towards the right side of history. That's, that is in itself a right-wing proposition now, the idea that there is such a thing as innate human nature. And I feel that that's like a really f sound foundation for comedy. In fact, that almost feels to me like, for most of my life, that's what comedy was, acknowledging the unavoidable, harsh realities of yeah. human nature and setting them comedically against our aspirations to overcome them, you know. Yeah. And now that seems almost like a quite regressive and, and, and reactionary... Well, I mean, it, I guess it is reactionary, but it's still potentially funny. Yeah. You know, so yeah, that's definitely. all I say, really, that, yeah. you know, you can be funny with those propositions. Yeah, and it's good for you to get some work out of it, don't you? Yeah, <laughs> but it's funny, you know, I mean, how Cruttenden... Um, he, we talked about this on Twitter, and he was like... Um, Oh, somebody was saying you're only left wing because you, you know, because you know that's what the BBC like now. And he went, Oh, I wish, believe me, if I could be right wing, I would because I'd get all that. <laughs> None of us are getting any fucking work. Do you know what I mean? It's this, that is a nonsense, the idea that anyone can be left wing or right wing and then sail into a job. You know, yeah, yeah. Jeff Norcott has a regular stint on the Daily Match. That's pretty much it. Lee Hurst hasn't been on BBC One for about 10 years because he's considered a bit too. Bit too on the nose on that sort of stuff. Now, you know, Jim Davison is, you know, it's not exactly sort of flourishing as the nation's darling. Is but it, how know? much does the how much does that kind of the the bitterness? Yeah, I think both sides, right? You know, getting people bitter they're not on TV because yeah. they think it's weighted one way, and then you get generally yeah. older middle class I'm white not. men saying, "And now it's weighted against us," and that yeah, bitterness yeah. maybe pushes some people towards. That political view as well. So it's, it's, well, who then? Who who can you see who's been pushed towards that? As well, that Jeff, the people say, well, Lee Hurst is Lee, Lee Hurst, Andrew Lawrence have been sort of pushed to a, to a and more extreme. And do you extreme... think they've got a lot of work out of it? No, no. I think, no. but I think, I think it maybe has affected their political views yeah. because they they feel in a certain, you know, they feel excluded in that way. Yeah. In the same way that on the other side, you've got. See, you know, what I'm saying is, I think saying, Lee Hurst has probably run its course as a TV comedian. He had some yeah. good years on that. Um, you know, if they think it's all over, but you know, I think he would probably say. And also, he's in permanent pain with his back now and stuff, and yeah. he's a bit grumpy. But um, <laughs> I think people like Andrew Lawrence, when they when they take issue with like Mock the Week, which he did, and I thought that was a sort of badly focused attack, and it, it lost a lot of its potential, you know, sympathy from me because he just seemed to sort of be all over the place with yeah. it. But a lot of that, it will give them some ammunition for saying, where are the people who think like me? Yeah. I don't know that Andrew Lawrence thinks he would have had a stellar BBC career without it. And he has had a Radio 4 show. You know, he's, he's not been completely cool. ignored. He's yeah. been fine. But every comedian has that little bit of, of like, I could have been, that could have been me, you yeah. know. But, I mean, you compare us to actors. I mean, actors, you know, every single thing they see and watch, you know, could have been them. And there's like 10 actors for every job going. You and I, you know, we make a living. We, yes. uh, you know, and, and most... Most comedians do. If they're intent on making a living and they have any talent at all, you can make a living. You sort of create your own work almost. Yeah. So there isn't quite the same level of bitterness, I think, in our industry that there would be in some. I think it's a legitimate concern to say we want to see some degree of representation of some sort of views or at least not dismiss the very notion that you can be funny from a right-wing perspective or, let's say, centre-right or just centrist, you know? Yeah, well, I think, it's, you know, you can, I think you've got to put those ideas out there even yeah. to, to challenge them. But, but, and on both sides, no-one challenges their own ideas anymore. No. And every, everyone's getting, but everyone's getting steadfastly yeah, yeah. into those ideas. But I also think there's uh, total freedom of speech and people can still say whatever they want it's to do. It's very good, And yeah. the truth is that, right, you know, the more right-wing politics is actually in the world... Yeah. is succeeding. And, and actually in news and current affairs, I think you'll see, you know, the balance yeah. has actually been a I bit think the other way. I think it's interesting. Well, that, you know, there is like uh, these things seesaw and you do, I mean, that's why it's called reactionary politics, isn't it? Because yeah. it is usually a reaction to things, to a, a community. I mean, Brazil, right, is under genuine, he's a genuine fascist, essentially, yeah, Bo Bolsonaro, yeah. right? But that is a reaction to years of essentially very soft policing, very soft 
social policy, it, 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 unaffordable welfare programs, extraordinary levels of drug abuse, you know, that doesn't come out of nowhere, those kind of, you know, they don't just go, do you know what would be a bit of a laugh? Imagine <laughs> if we were under, you know, militia and they were driving around policing us in tanks, you yeah. know, just for a, an aesthetic change, you know. These things are a reaction in a populace that have had enough of, of, of an over... Uh, you know. yeah. So is it going to happen here? Because I think people are pretty complacent at night. So I think like people are saying, oh, yeah, it would never happen. You know, things will sort of... It might happen. It's getting a bit more right-wing, but we'll always keep it checks and balances. It's not right-wing. Boris Johnson is... is uh, I mean, you know he wants to deliver Brexit, and, and that, I think, you have to put into some degree of a box um, what would happen. But he is, in all important political regards, to the left of Theresa May. He's, he's socially very liberal. He's pro-immigration. He's more immigration. It, to be honest, it is a disaster that he wasn't in charge of negotiation to begin with, because he would have drawn entirely different red lines. It would have taken about a year to come up with an economic, you know, e, e, uh, EFTA kind of type arrangement. They would maintain freedom of movement because that wouldn't have bothered him, and he would have, you know, I, I don't think he actually wanted it in the first place. I, I agree with the proposition that he was using it as a springboard to elevate his own status, you know, but having got there, you know, he is to the left of Theresa May, and he's probably in, in most important uh, socially and, and economically, I think he's probably to the left of the heart of the Tory party at the moment. So I don't see that as going, you know, as Brexit being like the birth of a fascist movement. On the continent, you can see a lot of right-wing populism, definitely, yeah. So it's September now. This will go out in December, I think. Yeah. Have we left the EU while the people at home are listening yeah. to this? <laughs> uh, that is one uh, hostage to fortune. I mean, he's pinned an awful lot on it, so I'd be amazed if he doesn't follow through somehow. But... Um, yeah, God knows. I don't know. I would have said so this time last year. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Al Murray, I spoke to you last night. He thinks it'll be ten. They'll get. They'll do an extension of ten years. <laughs> well, you see all these things, don't you? Like it is twenty three twenty five. Yeah. The year twenty three twenty five, and the Prime Minister of Britain attends the uh, the uh, traditional ceremony of the begging of an extension from Brussels. <laughs> this happens every ten years, and nobody you know, remains. You know, there was nothing in the referendum that said when it had to happen. No, right? Exactly. It just has to happen. We just do it. In, you know, we'd set it. I personally, 50, I mean, 75. of the various sort of scenarios that could come out of it, I think the establishment of London as a city state along Singaporean lines would work very well. I just think the, the boundary, you know, the M25 should include the A23 corridor. And I would like to see Brighton, <laughs> you know, possibly as far as Worthing. I don't know exactly. We'd be like West Berlin, basically, you know, connected by a corridor. <laughs> right. Uh, well, I won't, I'll, well, let's talk about something else. Um, we'll, see, we'll see if you are right. Um, uh, uh, we're not going to go on much longer because, you know, it's, it's a long old night, isn't it? <laughs> Someone's got to get home to Hertfordshire. <laughs> so I was going to say London. Is that where you live? Is that where yeah, your school is? Yeah, I live in Hertfordshire now, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, where, whereabouts? I'm not telling these people. I grew up in St Albans. <laughs> Are you, so well, you were born in Luton. I'm quite near to Luton. I'm quite near to Hitchin. Okay. I nearly lived in St Albans. Yeah. It's nice down there. It's the heart of comedy there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it used to be all right, you know, a lot yeah. of pubs. Yeah, yeah, a lot of pubs. It's a bit of a dormitory now. Well, Luton's a horrible place, though, right? We can all agree on that. <laughs> uh, and I live very near to it. Luton, or as EasyJet call it, London. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, it's the, yeah. so it didn't become the worst. They recently did a, a survey. It's usually Luton, but Belfast was the worst one now. Oh, right. So Luton's not even the best at being I the worst. I haven't been back there. I mean, I never lived there. I was born there because that was a local hospital. Oh, but, uh, yeah, no, I grew up in St Albans, which is... Uh, that's that's, yeah, that's yeah, more yeah, suited to you. Yeah, got an abbey and everything. Yeah. Yeah, it's all right. That's more suited to you. Right, we'll do, we'll do an emergency questions or two, okay. and then we will, we will call it a day. You had a nice time so far, Brighton? Yes. Oh, oh. They're lovely. It's warm, isn't it? Is it just me? Is it well, I'm wearing a jumper, so I'm fucking boiling. I, I, it's, <laughs> it's on the poster. People expect to you see it. You must be really prickly. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. It is actually... Uh, last week's guest, Annabelle, saying, does, it, does fluff come off it? I said, no, I don't think so, but then I've been noticing all and, uh, through the yeah. My fluff just gradually gravitating towards your mouth. <laughs> Luckily, you've got this kind of beard around here that gets caught up. And but I'm sure Annabelle ate quite a lot of my jumper. Part of a payment. This, well, actually, this jumper is so expensive that it actually is. It's very slimming, though. Yes. Yeah, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go one emergency question. Let's see which one I can find. I'm not going. Okay. Oh, 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 that's too. You're going to the back again. Long. I'm going to the, the back. The yeah, Ching we of. We went to the back shows. The backstage and the back. Shouldn't is... I like stick my finger in a? Um, should, should I not be allowed to pick a card? Well, it's, 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 it's a bit not risky. work. It doesn't doesn't always work. Let's try this one. I don't right. know what this is. 
Do you think the voice in your head that you perceive as yourself is the one making the actual decisions, or is there a shadowy other you for whom the you voice is just a toadying spokesperson yeah. who never speaks but makes all the actual choices that the you voice then has to justify yeah. to you? Confabulation. I mean, normally that would sound quite neutral, but off the back of the right-wing politics discussion, <laughs> sounds like an accusation, doesn't it? <laughs> but that's the theory, isn't it? There's meant yeah. to be you can you justify yeah. every, every decision you make and create a... the, the separate hemispheres yeah. and they're, oh, you guys are hilarious and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wrote a, a sitcom once where a man had his uh, he was a scientist. He had the hemispheres of his brain deliberately separated so he could play himself at chess. Right. <laughs> And you just have to have... Apparently, you can do that, and then you, you don't tell what the other one is, is doing yeah. and thinking and planning. Um, but there was a famous experiment, wasn't there, that demonstrated that um, people were making decisions, thinking they'd made decisions half a second after they had. Yeah, that's right. I think and that's this very week, I don't know if you're aware of it, it's been refuted. It's part oh, of the re 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 reproducibility crisis, which okay. has afflicted the whole of psychological and social <laughs> investigation for the last 50 years. None of these experiments work the second time <laughs> you do them. And that one turns out to be bollocks as well. Oh, so free will is back on the agenda. Hooray! Hooray! Yeah, I, it was exactly the right person yes. to ask that question to. I've never asked it before. Uh, have you ever seen? I do think, though, that as David Hume said, that the passions, are, the passions are king, and reason can only ever and should only ever aspire to be the slave of the passions. Yeah. Your passions determine your course of action, and reason, your rational mind, your intelligence, is there to justify it afterwards. And essentially, the more intelligent you are, the more capable of hypocrisy you are. That's all, <laughs> that's all it is. It is true. Let's. I don't know if I, we did an interview uh, in Edinburgh a long time ago, which I did listen to again. It was. It's amazing how much of this stuff I just forget happens. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't know if I ask you this question. Have you ever seen a ghost, Simon? <laughs> oh, that is quite a good one. Didn't yeah. see that coming. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no pun intended. No, I don't believe I have. But they, it's a quite a divisive issue in my family. Is it? My Aunt Margaret, who is yeah. also Christian, which is supposed to eliminate the use of ghosts, I thought. Well... But, yeah, church ghosts, yeah, yeah really <laughs> fierce. And if this conversation comes up at Christmas, as it usually does, yeah. you know, there is no laughing or joking around about ghosts. She saw them, and she saw the ghost of her father sit on the end of her bed on the night he died, apparently, and tell okay. her that he was going. So, um... I don't think that's... Why did she get that? Why did everyone know. get that? Yeah, that's exactly, not fair. Because she's the daughter, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I, I've never seen, I've never really felt paranormal activity, but um, uh, I have been with a dog that seemed to react to something like that. Oh, we I thought gonna, that was going to be a different story. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but nothing that, here we go. So I a lot of ectoplasm. A <laughs> lot of ectoplasm on the dog. <laughs> You've had a dog that's seen a ghost. Yeah, yeah. It, was in a, it wouldn't go into a certain room in a. Do you think um, it was a ghost of another dog? <laughs> Do they, do dogs see dog ghosts and we see human ghosts? That's a good question. We don't often see dog ghosts. Not many people go, I saw the ghost of a dog or a cat or a sheep. Well, the Hound of the Baskervilles was the ghost of a dog, wasn't it? But it turned out not to be. But maybe that was the that was the ingenious adaptation. No, I mean, that whole thing, that's the first time when things get complicated in heaven, isn't it? Where the dogs go to heaven, but you get all your dogs at once or because they might not all get on. Well, and husbands and wives, you know. Yeah. Well, there's usually, you know which one, isn't there, if you're honest. We'd all be able to pick out the heaven squad. And, you know, it's not fair if, you know, my wife will probably go to heaven and I probably won't go to heaven. My wife's deprived of me for but eternity. You, are you... Because you, you mock and ridicule the Christian yeah, church? Yeah, I mean, I don't think he'll let as me As long in. as you love your fellow man, that's said to be... I okay. don't really like you him. You don't like him either, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's the problematic area. But you can always, you know, have a proper Catholic confession in the yeah. last half an hour. I you know, it would be nice, but you, like, you think Jesus and God are going to be like you are. But he yeah. probably isn't. He's probably going to go... Fuck you. You weren't, it wasn't even your parents didn't even have the right one of me. Well, there's no version of heaven I've ever heard that sounds even tolerable, let alone appealing. Yeah. I mean, most of them, you know, written by anyone who has any real vested interest in it, you know, it amounts to endless worship, doesn't yeah. it? And bathing in the glory, you know, which is very egotistical. <laughs> you know? I like to be the one emanating glory. I think we've both chosen professions. Yeah. There's no point in pretending otherwise, you know. I like to be on the throne. I don't want to be there. So I would be cast out fairly quickly. You could yeah. be, or he might take over. You know, yeah. He's, he's, uh, Satan had a go. Better Satan, exactly. Better yeah. Satan in hell than yeah. uh, second in command. I mean, Satan yeah. must have thought he had a chance, right? So there must be a weakness there somewhere. Well, he did have a chance. He's had yeah. a fucking riot. Yeah. Jesus. Yes. He's had the best of the last 2,000 years, surely. <laughs> yeah. That should be obvious. 
Good. On that bombshell. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please go down for Simon Evans. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming, everyone. I'll see you in the bar. Please give some money to Stoke if you so wish. Thank you very much. Thank you. How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>